Hello and welcome to episode four of Where Do We Begin? And boy, oh boy, we've got a big one today. I say this every time, but this is bloody monumental. Who have we got, Jackson? We've got former Matilda, so international superstar and AFLW superstar, Brianna Davey. That is huge. Playing for Collingwood at the moment. Used to play for Carlton, of course. Uh, only Big played, fan when she when she jumped across. Yeah. <laughs> only played soccer for a f- few years in her earlier days, but 17 caps for the Matildas. That's pretty impressive, huh? Yeah, definitely. Anyone who plays for their country is just impressive, so she must have been at the top of her game at the point. Now, we'll go a bit back uh, back a few days to our last interview, Brett Rosebury. It was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very interesting to hear from an umpire's perspective of the current AFL climate. Yeah, and um, talking about rule changes and saying he doesn't want any rule changes and stuff like that. That was really – you don't get to talk to umpires too much and you don't hear much of them in the media, but that was really interesting. Yeah, it was definitely great to hear it in sight. Mm, and one of the greatest of all time, obviously. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, how many grand finals? Too many to count, but – like, um, yeah, one of the biggest, not known, because you think, uh, when you think of um, AFL umpires, you also you always think of like Razor Ray, but yeah. you Brett know Rosemary his face, de- but you don't know his name. Yeah, he's definitely. He's on the TV all yeah. the time, but yeah, someone so, said Brett Rosemary to some random footy fan in the game, they probably wouldn't know who that is. Yeah, so if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Yeah. Have a listen to it. It's an amazing interview. Yeah. And I think uh, we'll rip into this next one. This should be an amazing interview as well. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's rip into it. Now we're joined by former Matilda's goalkeeper and current AFL superstar, Bree Davey. Bree, how are you? Good, thanks guys. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Good. So we're honoured to have you on the show as our first current AFL player. This is just going to be a chat with us learning about you and, and your career. How does that sound? Yeah, no, it sounds great. Sounds great. All right. So first up, how was growing up? Yeah, really cool. I um, was fortunate enough to sort of, I guess, grow up in a family that sort of really embraced um, me for me. I was probably a little bit different um, when I was growing up and going against the grain of things a fair bit. Um, obviously, AFL was a very heavily male-dominated sport, um, and there was no women's leagues uh, whatsoever. But for me, I was the only girl playing. I, I just I followed my brother down. I think it was under oh, I would have been probably maybe six going into Oz Kick, and um, yeah, it was the only girl there. So yeah, like I said, went sort of against the grain of things. But um, family were always really um, really embraced me for what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. And um, so growing up was really cool. I have two sisters um, and a brother, an older brother, um, who are all quite sporty as well. So it was really cool to sort of grow up alongside them and out on the street we'd play. Uh, I grew up in Port Melbourne um, and we'd play along the street with all of our neighbours, all the kids um, on the street. We'd play whatever we could get our hands on really, whether it was um, well, you know, a soccer ball or cricket bat, whatever it was, we are out there doing some sort of sport. Um, and then we pretty much – once we'd been out all day, I'd pretty much head home and um, mum would and dad would have dinner ready for us and, yeah, we'd, we'd have dinner as a family and then we'd wake up the next day and do the same thing all over again. So, no, growing up was really, really cool and, again, I was um, – my my parents are both just amazing um, and awesome people and, again, they sort of let me be me even if at times I guess I traditionally didn't um, – I guess, tick the, the girl box every time. I was very so um, into, I guess, more traditionally boys things, if you'd call it. Um, but, yeah, um, pretty good growing up. So, obviously, you've had a top-level career in footy and soccer. Did you play for clubs in both sports in your early days? No, so I actually um, didn't play soccer until I was maybe about 12. Um, so, I, my sort of early childhood, I was more into my footy and my basketball. Um, so played, um, went down to, like I said, sort of mentioned, I followed my brother down to Auskirk and the first time I went there, I probably wasn't, um, embraced that, well, not embraced that well. Um, but I think it was odd for all of the little boys there to see a little girl rock up. So I was probably alienated a little bit. And then, um, I sort of left the Auskirk, um, after that sort of experience and decided I was going to stick with basketball. Um, but then a year later, I was like, no, nah, no way. I've, I love footy too much. I'm going to head back and try again. So I did. And then 
ended up playing at um, Port Melbourne Colts, which I played under 10s and under 12s there, um, and then um, played also for Melbourne Tigers um, rep basketball um, for under 10s, under 12s, and sort of junior under 14s. And that's when, um, yeah, at under 12s, that's when I made the oh, – after under 12s, should I say, that's when I made the swap to soccer. But, no, generally – my growing up was actually more football and basketball dominated. So you were picked up by Melbourne Victory at 15. How was that transition from playing juniors for only a few years to playing against grown women at such a young age? Yeah, well, look, it was, um, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, for me, my soccer career sort of just took off really, really fast. Um, I, I, I mean, since I was a little kid, I've wanted to sort of be a professional athlete. Um, at the time, it wasn't soccer, though, I think – I'd written down professional basketball a lot of times and I think I secretly wished I'd be a professional AFL player, but I knew that wasn't actually sort of realistic by that point um, because there was no league. Um, So, yeah, I I didn't think soccer was going to be something I was going to be playing professionally in. But, yeah, like I said, it sort of took off really fast. I I made – when I first started, I sort of um, went um, and – tried out for a, an indoor soccer team um, and I quickly got into that team. It was the Victorian um, indoor soccer team. And then from there, the same year, I went, I sort of went and tried out for the outdoor um, Victorian state team. And initially I wanted to be a midfielder and I started off as a midfielder, but quickly they sort of realised that I had some handling, ball handling skills from the background that I had. Um, and they said, do you want to have a go in goals? So we need someone. And this is often how goalkeepers start out. They don't want to be in there. Then they get shoved in there. Um, but, yeah, then I hopped in and initially I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a goalkeeper. Um, but as soon as I sort of started playing it and, you know, doing the goalkeeper training and those sorts of things, you sort of, yeah, you sort of fall in love with it and you all of a sudden have this newfound respect. I think a lot of people just think that goalkeepers stand in the in the box and, do nothing (laughs) but really you know we have to be pretty switched on the whole game because we've got one moment if the ball comes down in one moment and you haven't had it for 80 minutes of the game and all of a sudden it's down there you've got to be ready to you know pull out a save or whatever it is so yeah you've sort of find a newfound respect for it but going from I guess juniors to then into seniors like I said I don't know it was all a bit of a whirlwind for me because it just all happened so fast. Now I'm guessing you supported an AFL team in your early days, but did you support a soccer team as well? Yeah. Um, say so no, not really. Like I, I was from my back, my family history as well. Mum sort of grew up playing basketball, and uh, Dad he grew up playing footy. Um, so again, that that was heavily sort of in the roots of our family. I guess you could call it genes, or so, I don't know, but it was never soccer. So I didn't really grow up watching soccer either. Um, so no, I didn't have any passionate following. Like for a little bit. Um, a few friends from my primary school, like went in my late late years at primary school and then going to um, high school, some of my friends went for Liverpool. So I sort of jumped on that bandwagon at the time. But again, I wasn't, I wasn't passionate. I was much more passionate about my footy and Collingwood was actually, I initially was a Carlton supporter and then until I was about five years old and they started going through a bit of a <laughs> shit patch. So I decided I'd go to Collingwood <laughs> um, and I was Collingwood ever since, uh, since that. So um, yeah. Very passionate about footy when I was a kid. So you were a Melbourne Victory player in the early days of the W League. How was that experience? Yeah, um, it was it was awesome. Um, I was sort of part of the inaugural squad as a train on at the time because I was, I believe, 13 or 14. I um, can't remember now, but I was underage basically and I couldn't actually sign because I was too young. I think I was 13. So... Um, I was training with them um, with the inaugural squad then in the first year of um, the W League's existence and then um, got my debut, as you guys mentioned, as a 15-year-old. Um, and I think, if, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, again, it feels like it was eight so long ago now, but I think it was against Canberra in Canberra. Um, and, yeah, I just remember I've never felt those sorts of, sort of nerves ever in my life. Um, I remember sitting there and... Um, before the game against Canberra and I was in the change rooms and I literally thought I was going to throw up all over the change rooms. <laughs> so, um, yeah, look, it was it was a very cool experience playing at Melbourne Victory and um, I think it was back in the day, obviously, where because um, it was in such a early stage, there was definitely a lot of things that needed to improve at the time, obviously facilities and whatnot. But, again, um, I think just getting that taste of um, being – 
a professional or semi-professional athlete um, was really cool. When you were at Victory, about halfway through your stint there, you went on uh, over to Sweden on loan. I'm going to have a go at the name. Is it Linkerping? <laughs> Close. Everyone says that. I said that when I, when I first signed there until I got over there and realized I was saying it wrong. But no, it's actually Linkerping. So it's sort of, it's like, yeah, it's the K turns into a sh sound. <laughs> oh, yeah. So how was yeah. that whole experience over in Sweden? Yeah, really, really um, cool. So it was it was tough. Like, to be honest, it was probably one of the toughest experiences of my life. And what, what I mean by that, I guess for me, I was 18. So I was a baby. I just finished high school, I believe. Um, and, yeah, I'd, I'd gotten a call up um, to go and play over in, in Sweden for link shipping. And, um, yeah, I mean, I it took me a little bit of time to – sort of figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I'm, I'm such a homebody. Um, and so for me, and again, being a young kid, never been away from home for that long, I was sort of really hesitant about um, going, going. but then I decided, you know what, like this is what I've wanted to do. I've wanted to be professional and now I'm getting an opportunity to sort of actually travel the world and play professionally too. And um, I, so I sort of took it with both hands and Went over to Sweden and yeah, I think it was just the whole the culture the culture shock of it. Um, my teammates at the time were lovely, lovely people, and they did speak English, which was helpful. Um, but you know, obviously, their first language, well, most of them, all the Swedes, it was Swedish. So in the change rooms, they'd be you know having a laugh, having a joke, and speaking in Swedish, and you sort of just felt like a bit of a fly on the wall because it, you couldn't follow what was happening and. Um, so from that socially, from that side, it was really, really tough. Um, and I guess usually with any team, you know, even if it's an English speaking team, like it takes a little while when you're new to to find your feet and to and to make your friends and to, you know, sort of gel with the group. And um, mine, mine was a quick stint over there. So socially it was quite difficult, especially as a young kid, probably not lacking the social skills, but um, also sort of still figuring out who I was and, and what I wanted to be as an athlete as well. So while you were over there, you were described by one of the coaches as the world's most talented goalkeeper. As someone who'd only been playing in the position for about four years, how did that make you feel? Yeah, that was that was huge. Um, he actually, had, I'd seen that quote before I actually got on the plane to fly over there and I just thought, whoa, like that is a massive call. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, look, I... I hopped on the plane and it did give me a bit of confidence in the fact that he obviously had watched my stuff and he'd followed my, I guess, my short journey so far and he had obviously seen something in me to bring me across when they needed a goalkeeper. So it did give me a little bit of a little bit of confidence going over there. But yeah, look, I, it's yeah, it's a ma it's such a huge thing and I guess um, the weight of it didn't really hit me at the time of what he actually said. Now that people bring it up in interviews and now I guess my soccer career is I'm not playing soccer anymore and that sort of chapter of my life is sort of closed up. Um, it is huge when you hear it. It's like, whoa, that's that's a big call. And, um, you know, to be sort of, I guess, valued as probably, one of, you know, one of the most talented goalkeepers in the world, like he had said, um, you know, that's it's pretty cool. So, yeah, I – it. It didn't put too much pressure on me. I think, again, the weight of it didn't really sink in. I just thought I'm just going to go over there and just do what I do and do my best. And um, it was enough. So when I was over there, the sort of season had finished and um, I'd been offered to take another contract for the following year. Um, and, yeah, I, I ended up not going back. And um, I think part of that was I, it was tough. As much as it really shaped me as a person because I was living away from home and it made me lo learn a lot about myself and also to see how those girls train. Like over in Sweden, they have some real, real talent and the, the, the league was so super competitive. Um, so it made me lift as well as a, as a footballer. Now you played for the Matildas between 16 and 20 years old. Made your debut against Haiti in 2012, keeping a clean sheet. But then in your second game against America in LA, there were they were just coming off an Olympic win, I think, and there were 25 to 30 thousand people there. How special was that? Oh yeah, that look, that's um, yeah, huge. I actually one of uh, my coaches at Collingwood recently, I put the put a question out saying, you know, um, what what are you, you know, what's your proudest moment? Um, and I, that was the one thing I responded was. I mean, there's lots. You, you reflect on what you, what you've sort of done in your life, and there's lots. There's lots of things you can be proud of. But I think that was 
the 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 big thing for me that debut tournament I guess you could call it that I had over in the US um and reflecting on it, I was 16 years old um I obviously was just waiting and waiting to get my opportunity and um I and I got it and um at such a young age you you I guess again when you reflect it hits you a bit harder but yeah it was unreal walking out in front of that crowd in LA against the US um was just absolutely deafening um you couldn't hear the person literally two meters from you um and for a goalkeeper having to bark out orders um it made it very hard to communicate with your players and your and you know your defenders and stuff like that but yeah it was just unreal and um like I said walking out and having that deafening crowd whilst it was you know partly intimidating because the majority of them were crazy Americans going obviously who are against you but um at the same time it was really cool to see um where women's sport was, I guess, at the time in the US compared to Australia, we were not pulling crowds like that um, as a Matildas group then. Obviously, it's changed dramatically and, and um, you know, they're doing really well, which is I'm um, stoked for them. Um, but, yeah, at the time, it was just cool to see the difference and how, you know, the US um, or, you know, America got behind their US girls. It was just incredible. Yeah, I'm guessing US soccer is like it's a huge thing over there. It would have been amazing to see. Um, so you missed out on the 2015 World Cup. Was that a big surprise to you? Yeah, look, it's the, I, I do, I've had this question a fair bit, and I can I'm sure you guys can imagine why. Obviously, that was my last year with the Matildas. Um, and yeah, look, for me at the time. Um, I had sort of come off, I guess, again, I debuted when I was 16. I was 20 years old in 2015, so I'd been with the national team. I'd been training with the Matildas since I was a 14-year-old, um, but, again, got my debut in as a 16-year-old. So I'd been with them for six years, and um, since my debut, I guess, I'd sort of consistently played as that number one string um, goalkeeper until um, I actually got sort of admitted from the, the squad. So for me, obviously, going missing out on that, um, opportunity in that World Cup was devastating um, and I think got from going from, I guess, that number one spot to then missing out on three spots altogether that they take away because they take away three keepers to a World Cup generally um, was, yeah, it was pretty it was pretty devastating and um, I guess for, for me, again, I, I, I don't know if surprise is the right word, um, but, yeah, it was, like I said, it was devastating I and I probably didn't, I probably didn't see it coming as much as what I potentially could have. I don't know. <laughs> well, are you still in touch with most of the girls from that group? Yeah, look, a, a fair few of them. Obviously, got most of them on social media, and every now and then we'll respond to each other's stories and whatever else. But um, I definitely have my sort of closer mates that I would talk to a lot more often. Um, but definitely, I still, if one of uh, one of them was to message me, or if I was to message one of them, I'm sure we'd have a good chat and whatnot. But um, yeah, most of the girls playing now um, I played with. So, um, and and at the time, I mean, like I said, I was with the national team for six years. Um, you see them more than you see your own family. So they really do become that family for you at that time. Um, so, yeah, like I'm very fond of them. And um, like I said, if I was to see them, come across them and whatnot, it'd be, it'd be awesome to catch up. But, yeah, I've got my sort of closer friends I, I keep more con- in close contact with. Um, grew up really closely with Steph Catley. Um, so she's one person that um, we I see as much as I can is because she's very busy. And um, I've obviously got my AFLW stuff now as well. So, um, but, yeah, when, when Steph's back in the country, um, we'll catch up and – um, yeah, we chat often over the socials as well. So obviously back in the day, everyone sort of knew Sam Kerr as Daniel Kerr's sister and now yep. she's just such a big name in this country. How does that make you feel as a, a woman's footballer? Oh, it's it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Um, I think, yeah, obviously names like Sammy, um, you know, Steph Catley's, players like that, they're on there. They're national figures and not even – they're also worldwide figures. I mean, Sam, she's always been an absolute um, gun and I'm not saying that to piss in anyone's pocket or anything like that. That's it's She always has been. Ever, me and Sam played um, right through juniors together up into the Matildas and she'd always sort of been a bit of a calibre ahead of a lot of girls. Um, but, again, um, I think 
she's always been good. It's just the fact that people have actually started to notice or and look, I guess you could say. Um, and she's also hidden her hidden her straps. I mean, she was an absolute gun, like I said, right through juniors. But um, you know, you obviously peak at a certain age in your career too, and I think she's hit that as well. And everyone's um, actually acknowledging how good she is. Um, so yeah, um, Sammy's been awesome to watch, and again. I'm stoked that people like her um, and, you know, women's, you know, women's sports figures in general are starting to get noticed in Australia, but also around the world as well. Yeah. It's really great to see my little sister. She just loves soccer. So whenever she's here uh, talking about the Matildas, her eyes just light up. I love to see it, you know? (laughs) It's amazing. Oh, it's amazing. And that's what you want. You want um, them to be whoever they idolise to be inspiring them to, you know, hopefully if that, that's what they want to do, get out there as well and and pursue it. So, no, it's awesome. That's great to hear. Now, it must have been an incredibly tough decision to stop soccer and go over to footy. Was it just that World Cup missing out on that that swung it? No, so at, it's actually – it's funny. Again, that's sort of a common um, sort of – thoughts that people have. Um, but no, I, I mean, for me, um, I was actually planning to return to the Matildas. Obviously that was a setback. And like I said, I was devastated. I'd been training my butt off. I mean, the world cup is the pinnacle. We all know that it's a pinnacle of soccer and obviously the Olympics as well, but for soccer and just a celebration of soccer, the world cup is it. So missing out on that, um, like I said, was devastating. And I remember I uh, getting told in Sydney at a camp in Sydney that I was going home and not heading away with the group and they were literally getting on a flight to head over to the World Cup while I was getting on a flight to go home to Melbourne. So I remember getting home and I was like, you know what, for the next few days I'm just going to cry and I'm going to do whatever I need to do and I'm just going to push it all out um, and then I'm going to get off my sorry ass and basically get do, get back out there and do something. So for me at the time that do something was um, footy. So that's when the whole footy sort of chapter started. But like I said, my – my idea in my head was do something to distract me a little bit, give myself a little bit of a refresh. Um, so go play a bit of footy and then um, basically go back and play soccer. And I did. I went back and played at Melbourne City um, and then played the season there. We, we won a, a flag, a premier sh- uh, championship that year and then um, had a, the call to go back into camp for the Olympics with the Matildas. So the option was there to go back and um, – yeah, it wasn't necessarily the World Cup miss that made me make that decision. I think at the time, honestly, as simply as I can put it, it was what was going to make me happier. Um, and I'd been in, I guess, the professional setup in soccer for a long time since a little, really a, little, a baby, basically. And um, I think I was starting to really miss home. Um, like I touched on before, you don't see your family very much. You're often away at camp and um, if you do get come home, it's for very short stints and then you're off again. And, um, yeah, I just felt like I'd, I'd missed a fair chunk of being with my family and my family's life and, you know, missing significant birthdays. And these all seem like little things, but when you put them all together, it feels like a lot, especially as a young kid. So I think the fact that I'm a homebody really plays a big part of my decision as well. But also the the fact that footy was always my first sort of love, if you want to call it, and unfortunately, like I said, I couldn't pursue it. I knew I couldn't, and that was devastating when I was a kid. But um, basically, like I said, um, I went back and played at Melbourne City, and then all of a sudden um, they, uh, Gil McLaughlin came out and said um, there's going to be a, a AFLW, um, and that's when I – had been offered a marquee contract from Carlton um, and then also had the Matildas calling up saying to come back for the Olympic squad. And um, that's when I had to make my decision. And again, ultimately it was what, what will make me happy. And it was AFL, um, even though I knew it was risky and I wasn't sure when I made the decision, I was like, Oh my gosh, have I done the right thing? Will I regret this? Um, will AFLW even take off? You know, will I even be considered professional? Like I, the Matildas were going up, upwards and onwards too. And, you know, I was joining something that I didn't even know how it was going to go. So, yeah, um, basically happiness, what was going to make me happy, made me make my decision to go with AFL. Did you still watch that 2015 World Cup closely or was it too hard? It that is yeah, that's a great question. It was very mixed emotions. I did watch it, um, 
And I'm not going to sit here and say it was easy. It was really hard um, because I wanted to be there and I felt like I really, I felt like I should have been there. And so watching it was really, really hard. But the girls, like I said, the girls were like my family and like a bunch of sisters basically. And so I watched with a keen eye definitely because I wanted them to do well. But, um, yeah, again, it was that sort of mixed emotion. It was like, oh, this is really tough because it brings back, it brings a lot of emotion. I want to be there. But at the same time, you know, they're my friends and they're, they're people that I, I've spent, you know, the last four to six years with. So, yeah. What did you think of the Matils in the World Cup last year? Yeah, I, I watched that. Um, yeah, obviously there was a lot of – I felt like there was a lot of pressure put on them. Um, and, you know, they they have the talent. So I definitely was – when they were saying things like, you know, they could go close to winning it and whatnot, I definitely thought those things as well. They, they've got such a great bunch of talent. And um, I think all of the young – the young ones that had, were sort of coming through over the years had all sort of started to hit their straps at the same time. So it was a really, um, you know, strong young well, – some of them were young, but the ones that are sort of like come through, like, you know, the Sam Kerr's, Death Catley's, the ones that are sort of started to really hit their straps and get to that sort of peak age um, all sort of there at once. So I definitely um, thought they could have gone close to it too. Um, but, yeah, unfortunately it just wasn't – I guess wasn't to be for them, but um, yeah, it's exciting to watch them. I I, I find it really exciting watching them, um, and how they're how well they're doing. Do you have a personal favourite player in that team? Because personally, mine's Chloe Lagaza. I just love her watch, uh, running down the wing. Big fan of that. Yeah, yeah, no, you know she's a great player. And then and look, there's a handful of them that are just all um, great little players. Obviously, got you've got Sam Kerr. Um, I just I love how tough she is over the ball. Um, and, to, you know, partly of that part of that could be from the fact that she grew up playing footy. I don't know. Um, but she did grow up, grow up playing footy with the boys. But, yeah, she's just so strong over the ball. Um, Steph Catley, obviously, I'm going to be a bit biased. She's my best mate. But at the same time, um, I've always, always, um, as a goalkeeper especially, Steph was always my left back, um, no matter where I was. Matilda's, we played at Melbourne Victory together and then we both made the swap to Melbourne City together. So, you obviously create bonds with your defenders, especially because they're playing right in front of you. But yeah, when they're with you in literally every team you've ever played in, um, you, you sort of create a really, a really strong bond with each other. And um, yeah, um, would trust Steph. I, you could put her anywhere, but yeah, I, I'm more than happy to keep her as a left back if I'm playing goals. So moving on to footy now, uh, you seem to pick it up straight away um, after not playing since your juniors. And you were recognised as one of the top midfielders in the VWFL. How was the transition for you? Yeah, it was um, – I think for me the obvious one would just be the different sort of um, athleticism you need, I guess. Um, I went from a goalkeeper, which is explosive and short um, and sharp movements, jumping, those sorts of things. Um, whereas footy, you know, there's a large volume of running and that's not in the goalkeeping repertoire. So I basically had to – that was probably the main thing for me is just getting my running fitness back up. And when I was playing soccer, um, I definitely kept on top of my running. It wasn't um, in my program when I went to training. So I wasn't doing, really doing the running with the players. I was doing goalkeeper training, but I would often go home after training and then go for my own run. Um, and that was because I knew I felt better within myself if I was keeping running fit. But at the same time, I did think it would benefit my goalkeeping as well. Um so I did have a base there, but again, it's just not the same as when you actually get match fitness and you play footy. So I remember the first game, my God, like I thought I was going to die. It was it was tough. So um, that was probably the biggest thing. It wasn't really skills. It wasn't really um, oh, a little bit of scratching up on rules. And my first game, I ran through the mark, which I completely forgot you're not allowed to do. And I gave away 50 in the first two minutes of my <laughs> first game, thank you to Sharks. So that was really good first impression. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably it. Otherwise skills wise and actually getting in and sort of roving the ball wasn't a problem. Cause I, um, I, I was used to jumping and diving at feet. So I wasn't too afraid of that either. You played for the dogs in the exhibition matches in 2015 and 2016. Could you see back then how big AFLW was going to be now? Um, look somewhat, but, but not really as well at the same time. Like you definitely saw there was, 
some passionate supporters there of AFLW, but to the extent I didn't know that would happen um, in terms of the support that there is now. Um, in the last sort of exhibition game that was held and there was, um, I believe, an, oh, an like an All-Stars game, Vic versus, um, uh, yeah, the All-Stars, sorry, at the time. Um, that as well, I think after having those, you can definitely see the support that was there. Um like I said, particularly in the last exhibition game, Bulldogs versus Melbourne, we got in a really sort of cool crowd at um, Witten Oval. Um, but, yeah, again, I no, I didn't expect the – I wasn't sure anyway. And that's what, like I touched on before. That's why I was – when I did pick AFLW over soccer, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm taking a risk essentially. So you were signed by Carlton as a marquee player for the first ever AFLW season. How special was that to you? Oh, incredibly. Um, and I was sort of – in a way, forever be indebted to the club for that, um, you know, giving me the opportunity and them having the faith in me too. Each club got an opportunity to sign two each and that was it. So they had they had a choice of, you know, all of the girls that were playing footy in Australia and I was one of the people that they ideally wanted in their top two marquee signing. So when you look at it that way, it's incredibly humbling and, you know, like I said, um, forever grateful to Carlton for that Um opportunity um so yeah it was amazing to be a part of um and it was amazing to be a part of Carlton for the first uh three years of the of the seat uh sorry of the yeah the league so how was the feeling of actually finally playing professional women's footy incredible um I think we spoke I sort of spoke about before how it's probably one of my proudest moments playing my debut with the Matildas but that goes very close to it. Playing my first ever AFL women's game, that goes so, so incredibly close. You could almost put it on par Um, because I think for me with that, I mean, obviously women's soccer has started to become more identified now, like I'd sort of touched on. And, but back then too, we were definitely much more respected when I was playing as, as a soccer player than, than AFL players were at the time. Cause it, I mean, women's AFL has been around for longer than people know. It's been around for, you know, 25 plus years, but it's only starting to get the recognition now. So I think for me, the reason why it was such a proud moment and running out in that first inaugural game against Collingwood um, was just seeing the crowd. I remember I remember being under, so at Carlton, the women's change room is sort of under the grandstand. So when you hear noise, it sort of, you almost everything is sort of you sort of vibrate under there because people are on top of you and you can feel it on the roof. It's like you can feel stamping on the roof and just all this noise. And I remember we went out for the first warm up because um, we'd do two warm two warm ups before we'd run out. And the first warm up would probably be roughly forty five minutes to an hour before uh, ball up. And we ran out and we looked around and there was starting a crowd starting to build and we were like, well, this is cool. Most of us were used to. I mean, I, I had experience from my soccer days, obviously bigger crowds, but most of the girls coming from local footy had experienced maybe 200 people if they were lucky at the game. Um, and that's at the very, very max at a local game, um, probably a grand final. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden they're running out and there's probably about 5,000-ish people or to five, five to ten. So the girls, their eyes are all lit up like, wow, this is incredible. Look at this. This is really cool. So then we, after the first one, we went back in under the change rooms and um, we changed into our jerseys and then had our little team meetings and then got ready for the next um, next warm up. And as we're warming up inside, ready to run out um, before the the ball up, and we're doing our second warm up inside, it just started to get louder and louder and louder. And the girls, honestly, we all started to think, is there, is there a storm? Like, what is happening? This is ridiculous. Like, it's so loud. Um, and then by the time we ran out there to run through the banner, every single seat was full and there was, as you guys would have seen, it was a lockout. Um, not one person could get through the gate, not one more person could squeeze in. So I think the huge thing was running out and looking into the crowd and just seeing, you know, women um, who probably wished that they had the opportunity just bawling their eyes out. So running out and seeing that was just absolutely incredible and, you know, it, it's sort of it's sad in a way because it's it probably should have happened earlier and there's women who missed out. But at the same time, you know, we, we were there to do it first and we're now hoping, I mean, I know I'm I'm hoping to leave the game in a better place when I leave and I know a lot of the girls 
who got that experience are definitely feeling the same way. So yeah, it was just really cool. So we do have an audio grab of that first game. And here come the Blues, led out by Captain Lauren Arnell. She's played in eight premierships with the Darabin Falcons here in Melbourne. This is the biggest moment of her footballing life. Welcome to AFL Women's. So yeah, how does that make you feel? Yeah, honestly, shivers. Um, it's it, it does. It sort of it sort of does get you a bit emotional listening to that. Um, like I said, the opportunity to play Carlton of that first year of, of footy was probably one of the most memorable ones so far, and probably for the fact that that was our first you know crack at AFL women's, and I think that was the, this how special it was. I think that also plays into it, but. Yeah, listening to that back, um, it's it's weird. I've I've watched the game back actually, and whenever I see any replay or that I see the first ball up, I remember the first ball up was just bodies smashing against each other. It was it was crazy, and the crowd was just going nuts. But yeah, really, really, really cool listening to that. Now, in that 2017 season, Carlton finished fourth on the ladder despite having some. Great players such as yourself and uh, your Lauren Arnells and Darcy Vesios, those type of people. Um, do you have any regrets about that season and not quite finishing a bit higher? Yeah, it's it's actually yeah, it's a good question for me. I actually think that was probably the season that got away for us from us. To be honest, I know we played in a granny in that third season, um, but the first season, I don't know. I there was just a really special buzz about the group, um, and. I think that was for us probably the most disappointing season because I think we knew we were probably good enough to get further down the you know up the ladder, the ladder I suppose but with the short nature of the comp um, <clears throat> and the fact at that time it was one and two go straight into a grand final we sort of just fell short um, and yeah like I said I think for, for yeah definitely I think that first season we had some good players but we also I felt played just played for each other and it was really cool to be a part of. So, yeah, it was um, unfortunate that we, we probably didn't do as well as what we could have. Uh, on a personal note, you won the BNF that season. How special was that to you? Yeah, amazing. Um, again, I mean, honestly, no place should really play for those um, those awards and I definitely don't. For me, I'm probably one of the most competitive people you'll meet. So, for me, it's just about um, – it's – about getting the best um, out of myself for the team and obviously the, getting the best out of the team. So um, obviously to get acknowledged though at the end of the season was really lovely. It was it was really cool. Um, but again, yeah, it's um, it's not something you really think about until literally you walk you walk in that night and it's the best and fairest. And you're like, oh, okay, who's gonna who's gonna come through this tonight? But um, yeah, it's it was really cool. It was really cool. Now we're we'll going on to. Uh, how 2018 didn't quite go to plan for you in a sec, but um, you got appointed captain at the start of that season. How did that feel? Yeah, I, again, incredible. Um, it's peer voted. It was peer voted at Carlton, um, and at, well, at the time, um, it, I obviously Lauren Arnell was the captain in the first season. I thought she did had done an awesome job. Um, so I think in the second season, before the season when I'd been asked by the coaches if I'd like to take, you know, would I be comfortable in taking on the captaincy or, or would I be ready? Um, I think by that time I, I did. I, I did feel, I feel, I felt ready. Um, and the fact that they had the confidence in me and that they, you know, they wanted that and the club wanted that was, um, was pretty cool. So yeah, it took it with both hands, but then um, <clears throat> like you said, uh, sort of ended short, I guess for me in a, in a way. Um, so that was tough, but yeah, getting offered that captaincy um, and being the, the captain of the club was was incredible and something I definitely won't ever forget. So yeah, as as you did mention, you you did your ACL in the round two game. Uh, how yeah. tough was that for you? Yeah, it sucked. Um, I think um, I was just really keen to sort of hit the ground running that season and to get a good season. Like I said, after that first season, I I just really felt you know, there's that we have more to give, um, and 
we, and obviously we didn't quite make it to the end, which I, I was really keen to sort of, like I said, hit the ground running in season two and hopefully make something out of it. But for me, um, obviously that ended short um, for me. And in season, uh, sorry, in the game two against GWS, I did my knee. Um, and at the time I, I knew I'd done it. Um, and because it was just nothing I'd ever felt before. The pain was, for me anyway, it doesn't happen this way for everybody when they're doing their knee, but for me it was excruciating and not even the green whistle could settle me. I was just absolutely in agony. So they got me off and, again, the, the physio sort of looked at me and I said, can you just tell me? Like I I know pretty much I know I've done my knee. Don't You don't have to sugarcoat. Just let me know if I've done it. And she just sort of looked at me at the time. She, the physio just looked at me with sad eyes and nodded her head like, yep, you've done it. Um, and, yeah, I um, was pretty devastated that night but quickly knew I had, sort of had to sort of pull myself together because at the time obviously was the captain and regardless of on-field, off-field, um, I knew I still had to support the team. So um, once I had sort of dealt with the initial shock of it, um, yeah, I was all good to go. Now, those two games that you did play in, you won both of them, but then the Blues didn't win another for the season and finished bottom. Uh, how did that feel watching that from the sidelines, that kind of failure? Yeah, look, it's it's really tough because you obviously you feel helpless. There's not much you can really do to contribute um, when you're on the sidelines. I mean, they, there is. There is, of course, but not from an actual physical standpoint where you can run on the field and make an imp- and have an impact. So... For me, it was really, really tough. Um, and as the captain of the group, it was really, really tough. You sort of felt like um, you're letting down the group in a way. Um, so, yeah, it was it was hard. Season two was a really, really hard season for the club. Um, and for myself personally, it was hard too. But uh, coming back to the 2019 season, you led your side to the grand final, but you ultimately lost. But how proud were you to lead your team to the grand final? Oh, super, um, super proud. Um, <clears throat> I think we had a lot of work to do, um, in, you know, internally as a group after season two. Um, we, acknowledge, we acknowledge that. We were very honest um, and we sat down as a group and were very, very honest about what we needed to do to get ourselves, you know, back on track. And um, then we put in a lot of work in the preseason and, again, then went into a season and were fortunate enough to make finals and then get into a granny. Um, and, look, like I said, it's without the the hard work of the girls, you know, we wouldn't have been there. So whilst, yeah, it was great, you know, being the captain of the group, um, being one of the leaders, it was great to help lead the group towards that um, and towards that goal of getting to a premiership, like getting into a grand final. But um, like I said, without, without the hard work of the girls, that doesn't happen. Um, so, yeah, I was super proud, um, but it was a, you know, it was a whole unit. It was a whole team effort. So I do remember watching that game on TV, but how was the crowd there? Like it was huge. So how, how did you experience it as a player? Yeah, 53,000 or, or something like, I don't know the specific number, but it was around 53 just over. Um, it, oh, it was unreal. That's the biggest crowd that I've ever experienced, um, more than anything I experienced in my soccer career. So um, it was even sort of new for me. Um, but, yeah, I remember – we were in the change rooms and because of the first game, um, the first ever game, and we ended up having that lockout, I sort of thought to myself, you know what, this could be another huge turnout. I w- I'm not going to be surprised if it's another huge turnout. And I sort of thought that to myself. And I looked around at the group and we were about to run out and I pulled them all in and I said, I just said, girls, do not be surprised if every single seat is full tonight, like when we run out there. Um, and we did, and so, like, lo and behold, it was absolutely packed. Um, and, you know, as we're running out the little, not the fireworks, but the the fire, I don't even know what they're called, but we're running out and they're popping off and, like, you know, we're running through the banner and people are screaming. It was crazy. Um, but, yeah, just so awesome to be a part of. And, again, that's, you know, that's another thing I won't ever, ever forget. And then soon after that you moved to Collingwood. Did that come about? Did your childhood support of them have anything to do with it or how did that come about? No, so it didn't actually. I, I think when I had um, sort of made the transition to soccer, I sort of had – I didn't lose interest in AFL, but I didn't see myself in AFL because girls didn't have an opportunity. 
Um, so not that I dropped it completely. I still was a Collingwood supporter, but I wasn't as passionate. I was absolute diehard when I was a kid. I knew all the players. You gave me a number. I could tell you who, who wore it. Um, I was just crazy about Collingwood at the time. Um, but, yeah, I sort of fell away from it. Um, so, no, nah, it didn't really have anything to do with my decision um, going across. I will say it was an extremely, extremely difficult one. Um, obviously, as you guys have probably heard, I speak pretty fondly of my memories at Carlton, um, and I always will. It was a great club um, to be part of. The girls were awesome. Um, and, yeah, I, I mean, I played the inaugural game for them um, and captained the team. So, you know, you look at all of that and you think, yeah, why would somebody leave? But for me, it was about pushing myself as an athlete. And I know any time I'd done that um, – in my career with soccer, when it, you know, when I went to Sweden, it was the hardest experience of my life, but it hands down made me a better footballer um, and, and a better person. Um, so for me, it was about pushing myself and putting myself into a new environment. I'd been at Carlton, you could say, for four years, three seasons, but four years really. Um, and I think for me, it was about pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I could have easily probably sat in my little bubble at Carlton and been really comfortable and, you know, known everything back to front and and whatnot and maybe not pushed myself or I could have made the hard choice, which at the time was um, put in front of me, which was leaving a club I was captaining at the time and pushing myself out of my comfort zone and um, trying to evolve a bit. Um, and, yeah, I, I ended up picking going to Collingwood and that was, again, it was I'm not going to shy from it, it was really tough, um, an emotional decision. But now that it, now that I've done it, um, it's given me an opportunity to meet new people, work with new people, be in a, in a new environment, and really have to earn my stripes again. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm I'm continuously trying to do. And like I said, um, I mean the club's been the club has been absolutely awesome at Collingwood, and the girls have been absolutely awesome in embracing me and bringing me in. Um, and I, like I said, I, I continue to to do that and continue to sort of embrace the club and hopefully the, brace, the club embraces me too. For the size of the comp, the AFLW has a quite a bit more player movement than the AFL. Why do you reckon that is? Just, look, I think at the moment it's it's early days um, with the comp. I think there's there's a handful of, of things. There's um, obviously the fact that we've got expanding – we've got expanding – an expanding league, so there's going to be a lot of player movement. Mine obviously was to an existing club, so that's where it differs, but – a lot of other girls that are making the jump is to, I mean, everyone's got their own reasons. I can't speak on, on behalf of all of them, but at the moment I would say, at, you know, as a general principle, you'll see some movement because we're continuously getting new clubs and players and the AFL really are wanting players to sort of spread out a bit um, because you don't want, um, you know, if you, you're not spreading out the talent, these new clubs are going to probably struggle. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a it's a mix of things, but I think at the the point while this this um, league is so new and they're bringing in more AFLW teams, there's going to be player movement. I'm a massive Collingwood fan. Um, just reading, I'm a big AFLW fan as well. Love watching the girls. Just reading that, oh, Bree Davey interested in a trade to Collingwood. I, the, my eyes lit up. I was like, oh, an amazing player <laughs> wanting to come to the Pies. Oh, I couldn't love it anymore. How does that make you feel when the fans <laughs> want you to come as well? Yeah, look, it's it's awesome, and um, like I said at the time, it was really it was a really emotional thing for me. And but when it sort of did come about that um, I'd made the choice, and then it was sort of made public, um, yeah, the this the support and the response was incredible. Um, and obviously, I had um, sort of the Collingwood girls um, getting around me, obviously when they had found that I was coming across, and then obviously, like you said, supporters. So it definitely makes it easier because um, obviously I, I'm I'm ultimately disappointing a big bunch of people too. So, yeah, it, it may, like I said, it may, it does make it um, you feel a bit better. But like I said, there's there's that sort of weird um, bittersweet sort of thing where you, you are letting – you are ultimately probably letting down some people, but at the same time you, you're making some people happy too, I guess. So, yeah. Last year um, you were one of the AFLW players who helped the Pies VFLW team win the flag. Um, do you think that – competition has more relevance than the men's VFL comp? Um, look, yeah, that's uh, 
it's that's a tough one. I guess for me, the most important thing, especially through the AFL Cup, is making sure the the girls who are missing are playing. Um, so I don't know if you could say it has more relevance because it's so super important that it's there. You know, obviously with the AFL men's, that's where the boys who just missed out go and play and prove themselves and get back into the squad, and that that you know that provides a really good culture within teams where people are fighting for spot, but. Yeah, I think for us, obviously, to be honest, I mean, it's what we play in for majority of the year. Um, now, the AFLW girls don't play often every game because we're going into an AF, you know, an AFLW season, which is what they need us to be fit and ready to go for. Um, but in saying that, I mean, you look at the year and how it's spread out and, you know, most, like I said, the, the VFLW goes longer than the AFLW, so... A lot, of, a lot of the time we're, we're, we're developing and learning throughout that VFLW season. So you started off this last uh, AFLW season off slowly but found your rhythm. How did you think your first season in black and white went? Yeah, look, not too bad. I think for me the frustrating sort of thing was um, just getting on top of my body. Um, I was sort of keen to, again, this season to hit the ground running at it and like I sort of spoke about before and really earn my stripes at, at Collingwood because – um, yep, I'd, I'd done and achieved some things at, at Carlton, but that was at Carlton. I, I needed to do the same thing at Collingwood and, you know, just – and obviously earn respect to the girls and the club and and whatnot. And, look, I think um, I, after the probably the first couple of games, I really sort of started to hit form and, and play the football I know I can play. Um, but at the same time, I still don't think I probably hit potential if I'm being completely honest Um, because, like I said, I I sort of struggled a little bit with my body all season. Um, Running into the season, I just had sort of niggle after niggle, so my pre-season was quite interrupted. And then um, going into the first game, I tore my shin um, membrane, which is weird to do once, I did, but I've done it twice. Um, So, um, yeah, that sort of kept me out. Obviously, I missed the Carlton game round two, and then I came back – um, for the Freo game in round three. Um, and then from there, like I said, I, th- I thought I sort of got back to a bit of form. But, yeah, I mean, look, I I don't think it was, a, um, you know, a bad season or anything like that. I just I just would have liked to have a sort of more injury-free season where I could have a better run at it. So, obviously, moving from Carlton to Collingwood, two of the biggest clubs in AFL, how is the difference between the fans and the, at the games? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's look it's it's sort of the same same I guess I mean I don't I don't know if there's too much difference for me anyway personally I mean I've I've come I've gone from Carlton where um, big club had a really good women's supporter base um, so you really did feel that support when you played um, for, at Carlton but then it's same at Collingwood and and we do have have some real I guess you could say you know those really um, diehard sort of supporters that were at every session. Um, and there's there's a couple of people I know quite well now through them being there all the time and, and saying hello and, and cheering us on at training, um, you know, ra- literally um, rain, hail or shine, they were there. So, yeah, that was pretty cool to see. I, I didn't didn't quite get that as much at Carlton. You know, you'd have um, maybe some of the supporters rock up every now and then to watch a session, but at, um, at Collingwood, there was a select few that were there every time. So that was pretty cool to experience um, the support and the love from that. But, again, um, yeah, the difference, I don't know, probably probably not too too major. I think um, Carlton have really good support and, and so do Collingwood. Social media is such a prevalent thing in the lives of every sports person really now these days. Um, we've seen mm-hmm. Taylor Harris cop heaps of shock and abuse online. Have you had anything like that and how do you deal with it? Um, I luckily probably have been pretty, um, yeah, I, it might be a little bit boring. <laughs> I've, I've been pretty lucky with that. I think the most slack I've ever gotten was when the whole trade thing happens. Um, and that was probably the most, but even then, um, I was lucky. I, I didn't cop too much abuse. I think I just copped the sort of, um, odd, oh, you're a trader. <laughs> um, and you know what, for me, I sort of viewed that as a positive thing. I mean, not that I'm a trader, but I viewed it as, you know, people are starting to really invest in women's footy and they're starting to really feel, um, you know, what you sort of maybe see in the men's leagues where people almost take personally when someone leaves the club and they get upset and because because they love you being there um, and they love you being able to play for their club. So 
I think I try to flip it and look at it like that because I think if you look at it in a negative light at times, you're just going to sort of do your own head in. And like I said, it was already an emotional thing for me, so I sort of had to try and flip it and put it positive. But, yeah, I mean, look, I've I've seen some other abuse that other players have copped and, yeah, heart goes out to them. You, you hope that they obviously are dealing with it okay. And I've played with Tate Carlton and she usually seemed to deal with it really well, although I'm sure at times, that, like anyone, it, it would it would get at you, especially when people are saying really horrible things. Um, but, yeah, Tay, Tay, from what I experienced when I was there at Carlton, handled it really well. Now, we spoke about your family before, and it's different for everyone, but how does your family get behind your career specifically? Oh, they they are just the best. Um, so, like I said, I sort of touched on earlier, but I'm one of four kids. So I've got an older brother, older sister, and my younger sister, and then my parents, my mum and dad. Um and they've all just been incredible right from day dot, um, from when I was a little kid um, right up until now. But, yeah, uh, Dad and Mum both equally used to drive me to all of my training sessions. This was more soccer days. Um, my soccer days, they'd be, you know, they'd work at, all day and then they'd take them to foot, soccer training and then they wouldn't be getting home until 10, 30, 11 p.m. with me after training. So, like, they bent over backwards for me um, and um, – Obviously, my siblings as well are just incredible. They, they come to every game. You can hear them screaming on the sidelines. I'm sure if you, you guys do come to a game or if you've already been to a game, you probably if you walk past them, you'll know who they are because they don't shut up. But, um, yeah, they, they absolutely love it um, and they love me and I bloody love them as well. So, yeah, they're, they're incredible. Obviously, we can't relate to your experience because we aren't female, but – Harper and I, as people who are interested in supporting women's sport and gender equality, what would you like to see from people like us? Um, I think, look, I think for me the the biggest thing is, yeah, just staying in touch with that sort of stuff. And if you, you're hearing someone say something, it's not always easy, but having, I guess, the tools to call things out um, I think a lot of the time, um, especially in Australia, unfortunately, you know, there's that sort of casual, those casual jokes um, and those casual sort of sexist remarks at times and people sort of sweep it under the rug, but it's really not on. And look, I, I think AFLW is a really family-friendly space and you don't often get that at games, which is really, really amazing. Um, you don't often get that, but, you know, things like online and, and things like that, I think it's just about people putting putting others in their place when they need to um, because I think often, quite often, um, like I said, it becomes that casual sort of, oh, they were just joking, like let's let's laugh it off um, when really it's actually offending, you know, a lot of people. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, that would probably be my main thing. Now, we haven't got in the men's comp yet an out gay AFL player, but in the women's comp we've got heaps. Mm. So what do you reckon the difference is between yep. that and how can we change it? Yeah, it's that is it's such a great question, and to be honest, I think it's such a complex one. I don't actually even know the answer, but um, you're right. There's there's so many um, couples out in AFLW. Um, obviously, I'm one myself um, with my partner Tilly, who's at St Kilda now. Um, but yeah, the men's there hasn't been really any official player or couple come out yet. So I don't know. I think it's a cultural thing. I think f- from when AFLW started, it was just very out in the open and people knew that what to expect almost. Um, there's a lot, there's probably a large percentage of gay women playing in, in the comp um, and there's there's a lot of heteros, heterosexual women playing too in the comp. So it's not just um, obviously obviously um, gay, uh, gay women. But, um, yeah, I think from the very start it was just, a space where everyone knew that that it was accepted. Um, and I, I don't think, you know, you go back a hundred years ago when the AFL started, um, or, you know, existed, you know, society was not like it is today. It was not accepting of gay people. And I think that culture has just continued on. And unfortunately, I think they're sort of still stuck in that culture. Obviously it's getting better. And I think once, I think once the first gay AFL man comes out with his boyfriend, or if it's someone in the league, you know, whoever is in the league. But I think once that happens, it will sort of kickstart a, a shift in it. But um, whoever does will be, I believe, will be very brave as well because it's it's not an easy thing to do, let alone in the public eye like they are. 
Yeah, it's definitely a, a very tough thing to do. Um, how can men in sport be a good ally and help the growth of women's sport? Yeah, um, I definitely think, absolutely. I think um, we can really bounce off each other. I mean, obviously with the AFL women's coming in, we've brought a whole new audience to the to the game, um, you could argue. Um, but then on the flip side, obviously, the men have established and created such a great foundation of what the AFL is today and the fact that there's money to fund a women's, you know, sort of um, league. So really I think it's gotten to a point where we're going to start to rely on each other because without the AFL start, AFLW starting as well, we the AFL were losing people to other sports that had – a male and female sort of affiliate um, league. Um, and, you know, a lot of young girls were going to soccer. Therefore, a lot of families were turning to soccer, for example. So, yeah, I think in terms of being allies, we obviously just need to support each other and, and understand that we're part of a big circle now. The AFL isn't just about AFL men's anymore um, and they really have to move with the times for it to continue to be, a, you know, a, a powerhouse in um, Australian sport, I believe. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's that. And obviously going forward, um, you know, I, I don't know what's, what's going to happen in terms of, I know Cricket Australia, um, they negotiated like a contract with their women, whether that we go down that track, who knows, but, um, I think definitely we, that we can be allies for each other. So getting closer to, in terms of Collingwood, uh, you have Lyndon Dunn as one of your coaches who's a senior men's player or at least was, now he's on the rookie list. Um, how, in other ways, what do the club do to help the women's players, especially the men's team? What do they do to help? Yep. Um, oh, so at the moment, like you said, Lyndon Dunn's been in there. Um, Brody Grundy's come in a couple of times to work with our rucks. Um, so that's been awesome and I know um, – Shani Layton's told me a few times how she sat down, gone into the club and actually sat down with him and gone through clips and he's given her little pointers, which is incredible. So, um, yeah, I think it's more individual um, players who have been in there to help. Like I said, Grundy, um, Lyndon Dunn, Jordan Roughhead as well. He's been coming. He was going in on Wednesdays during AFLW and doing like a specialist session with us girls. Um, but, yeah, I think it's, it's so super important to see that engagement with the men's team and, I think it can only get better and I, I could probably speak on behalf of a lot of AFL women's programs in different clubs, like in terms of the connection that most clubs have with their men's team can always get better. But I think, like I said, like you said, when we speak about allies, I think that's the other thing, you know, the boys taking some interest in our, in our league and helping us promote it too because, again, I think it's only going to help AFL as a whole, which will help them as well really in the long run. So, um, yeah. Now, clearly AFLW is not a year-round full-time thing. What's your day job? So at the moment, I'm I'm actually studying um, still. So with um, when I was a Matilda and whatnot, um, it made it really hard to go to uni, so I didn't. Um, then so recent, more recently I've started studying again now that I'm not playing um, and sort of travelling around. So I'm um, studying teaching, so it's a uh, prep to 12 Bachelor of Education, so I'll be sort of um, qualified for both. Um, and then on the side, I sort of do um, – I do well, I do some coaching on the side as well um, through Collingwood. So last year I was with Box Hill Senior Secondary running um, or helping to run the program, the women's footy program there. Um, yeah, not sure what this year is going to look like though, obviously, with everything going on. We'll talk about your hobbies a bit now. We've got a little audio grab we'll go to. I can play the guitar and I sing a bit. I know a fair few of the girls think that I think I'm a pop star. That is also wrong. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's from the victory when you were about 17. You still a big oh singer? Gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm okay. I'm very basic. I, I still play a little bit. I think in isolation I'm, I'm trying to pick, it, pick the guitar back up a little bit and probably get a bit better than, than what I am. But, no, nah, look. I, again, I'm very basic. I'm nothing special, but <laughs> I enjoy it. So, you know, that's the main thing. Now, in the last little segment of the show, we like to do a little quiz with our guests. Uh, so you're going to cool. be going up against Jackson, uh, and oh. it's a little bit about uh, your career and stuff associated with the career, really. So uh, your name is your buzzer. Just buzz in with Bree or Jackson. And, yeah, let's go. Uh, question one. So uh, this is just closest to the pin. 
Uh, so you debuted from the Messiah. It was against Haiti. Can you tell me what the population of Haiti is? Bree. Bree. <laughs> I've actually got no idea. Um, oh, shit. I've got no clue. I know it's a tiny, tiny little island, though. Um, or 50,000. 50,000. What do you reckon, Jackson? Um, 300,000. <laughs> well, Jackson, you get the point because you're closer. It's 11 million. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Nowhere, <All right>. nowhere <laughs> near. Uh, okay, and another Matildas question. Uh, where are the Matildas ranked in the world at the moment? Oh, I should know this. Jackson. Jackson. Fifth. Fifth. No. Uh, Bree. Um, I'm gonna go eighth. Oh, close. Seventh. Oh. Oh. So do I get that? Nah. <laughs> still one hill, Jackson. <laughs> You should get this one, I hope. Uh, uh, you were named in the 2017 All-Australian team. Can you na- name another player uh, that was named in the defence of that team? Oh, Bree. Jackson. Um, Bree just oh. got in first. <laughs> um, Chelsea Randall. Chelsea was, Randall is correct. Oh, that's going to be my answer Nicholas too. Nicholas Stevens, Courtney <laughs> Cramey and Karen Paxman. Uh, question four, one. one all. Uh, what's your record for most disposals in an AFLW game? Jackson. Jackson. Three. <laughs> um, just, just stab 21. 21, nah. 30. 30 is correct. Who was it against? Do you remember? Bulldogs. Yeah, dogs in round five this year. Oof. Taking the lead. <laughs> we're into the last question. Now, this is a who am I? So we're going to start. I'll give some clues. It's going to start at five points, and then for every clue, it's going to go down a point. So five, four, three, two, one. Uh, okay. For five points, I've played 14 AFLW games. And remember, this is all stuff associated with Bree's career. No one want to buzz in? Okay, Wait, I'll go to the no. next one. Yeah, 14 <laughs> AFLW games for five points if you want to answer now. But you can't Bree. buzz back in. Yep, Bree? Me. No, nah, it's not you. <laughs> oh. Oh, now, the, now the pressure's on. <laughs> okay, um, four, for four points. I grew up in Whittlesea in Melbourne's outer northeast. No, I've got no clue. Keep no. going. Uh, and if Jackson answers and gets it hey, wrong, I'll done. open it b- back up to both of you. So, Bree, you can't buzz in yet because you've already buzzed in. But for three points, Jackson, I was born on the 6th of December in 1998 and have been Bree's teammate for one of my three years in the AFLW. Is it Chloe Malloy? Chloe Malloy is correct. Yes. Jackson oh, takes the win. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, for those playing at home, final clues were played basketball in my teenage years, was offered some scholarships in the US but turned them down. Uh, for one point, I won the Collingwood Best and Ferris and AFL Women's Rising Star in 2018, as well as being named in the back pocket of the All-Australian team. And I think that just about wraps yeah. us up. Thanks for ha- coming on, bro. Oh, thanks, guys. It was awesome. It was re- I really enjoyed um, talking to you both. Yeah, thank you so much, Bray. Cheers. See ya. Thanks, Pete. Gee whiz, Jackson, mate. How good was that? That was absolutely fantastic. A big thank you to Bray for coming on. Phenomenal. It's just the amount of time she gave us, the depth to her answers, just brilliant. Yeah, I cannot be more thankful. So, yes, again, thank you so much <laughs> yeah. for coming on, Bray. We say this to everyone, but... Bree, like, you've been the best interview we've had, we've had so far. So thank you so much again. It's been brilliant. Now, we uh, usually go into a little uh, last segment at the end of the show, a topic related to the person we've just interviewed. What's our topic today? So seeing as Bree is one of the bigger high-profile cross-coders uh, in the AFLW, so we're just going to kind of talk about cross-coders in sport, people who have excelled in two different sports. Now, so I- who have you got first up? AFLW and the AFL's got quite a few as well, but AFLW's got heaps because it just I, started recently. So you've got Erin Phillips. Oh, obviously. Yeah, huge. She won the AFLW Best and Fairest in 2017. Yep, basketballer um, in, is it Phoenix or is it the Arizona team? I'm, it, it, they're the same, sta- the same state, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they're called Arizona, but WNBA. Yeah. Well, anyway, probably the best player in the league, yeah. other than three, of course, our number one. Uh, <laughs> our number one, Bree's the number one. <laughs> Always here, Alex Bree. Uh so who else have we got in the AFLW? You've got um, I know uh, Taylor Harris. She does boxing yes. as well, but I don't think she went from boxing to AFL. 
No, I she's just in, like, in the off season. She's a professional off. boxer. Yeah, yeah. So I think she sort of more identifies as a boxer who plays AFLW, not mm. an AFLW player who used to play a different sport. Yeah. Um, uh, in the men's league, you've got um, all the Irishmen. Uh, yeah, a lot of Irishmen coming from Gaelic football. Yeah, Con McKenna. Con McKenna, yeah. definitely a big one. Took some time away. <laughs> uh, he was he went over there for a little break earlier this year. One of the uh, more, more famous ones, Jim Steins, obviously. Jim Steins, yeah. Um, who else have we got? We've got uh, our favourite, big fan of the show, Carmichael Hunt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Carmichael. Yep, and Izzy Folau. Izzy Folau, the two rugby players. Look, honestly, I don't think Carmichael Hunt did that badly for the Gold Coast in those first he few seasons. That goal against Richmond. Oh, it was fantastic. All you could wish. But yeah, I don't think he did too badly. As and it's understandable him wanting to go back to rugby. Fair enough. I think he played for Australia after that. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I feel he did. I think so. Yeah. Um, getting back to well, AFL. Did, yeah, yeah, getting back to AFLW. A lot of players, um, obviously finding their footy dreams. But one player who switched back to their original sport, Jenna McCormick. Played for, um, I think, Sydney or in the W League and then crossed across to um, Adelaide Crows, won the premiership, won the two premierships, I think, and then moved back to soccer, playing for Melbourne Victory and as soon as she got back into soccer, she's starting for the Matildas. And we've forgotten about one of the biggest names in Australian sport, Ash Barty. Oh, of course. Tennis to cricket, back to tennis. Oh, yeah, and definitely. won the French Open last year, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. Oh, I think it was last fan? year, yeah. A um, little bit. I'll, I'll watch it when the Oz opens on, but, yeah, Barty's a big one. Yep. Uh, Alex Carey also, footy to, Alex Carey, yeah. footy to cricket, um, Adelaide Strikers. Uh, another – is it Alex Keith? Is that his name? I think so, yeah, Alex Keith. the dogs now, I think. He yeah. went from the Crows to the dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was a cricketer, I think. He was a cricketer, yeah. yeah. He um, was a big cricketer. Yeah, yeah, trying to think. I can't – there's a lot There's a lot that we can't think of off the top of our heads. But the female cricketer that – um, oh, Elise Perry. Elise Perry. Oh, yes, big that's one. Name. Matilda into, but she was playing both sports at the same time. That's incredible. Yeah, but now she's gone like full time cricket, cricket. cricket. But just the way that she literally played for the, both Australia teams at the same time is fantastic. Is she married to Mitch Stark? Is that her? Or is that? No, that's uh, Healy, the keeper. Healy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mix those two, two up all the time. <laughs> uh, who else have we got? We got, I think we've exhausted the list. Oh, there's months, plenty really. in AFLW. Um, yeah, I just can't think of the top Make sure you here. let us know yeah. by all the socials. What are our socials, Jackson? Uh, we've got Facebook. We've got, uh, so it's where do we begin pod? With a question mark. With a question mark. Uh, we got Instagram and Twitter, both the same. WDWB pod. Look us up. Give us a follow. And uh, we've got our, our email if you want to get in touch with us. Where do we begin pod at gmail.com. Yeah, it's too easy. So. Yeah. Love, love, again, fantastic episode. I'm super proud of this one. So hope you guys are too. Get us, get in touch with us. Tell us how much you like this one. Give us a five-star review. That would be massively appreciated. And, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, it's too easy. See ya. See ya.